Thank you, whoever is uh, watching. Uh, and I'm very, very, very happy to have uh, Amelia Jones and Emily Coates uh, with, with us today. They're both uh, great writers and their uh, essays are currently in the current issue of TDR volume 64, number four, our fourth issue with Cambridge. I really recommend these uh, articles to you. They're models of what I believe scholarship ought to strive for, clarity, uh, 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 detail, uh, historical awareness, uh, uh, and uh, just a beautiful writing. So I'm really glad to have you. And I, I want to begin, uh, uh, we're gonna be talking about living archives. It's almost uh, for me a, a, a very powerful oxymoron. In other words, we sometimes think of archives as the past you go when you uh, dig it up and it's, uh, but these particular archives that these two uh, uh, fine scholars are uh, writing about are about, mostly about living people. Uh, Amelia is dealing with a major living artist, uh, Suzanne Lacey, and also uh, to some degree with Alan Capro, who has passed and so on. But, uh, and Emily is uh, dealing with Yvonne Rayner, uh, perhaps the most single most influential quote postmodern quote uh, dancer of our, of our time. Uh, so let me start with Emily. And I would, I'm going to ask you each to briefly summarize uh, the key points of your, uh, your essay. And then hopefully we will be able to get, or the two of you will be able to get involved in a discussion about where your points of view, where your subjects uh, uh, overlap and, and, inter and interact. So uh, Emily, the uh, camera and Great. the microphone are yours. Thank you so much, Richard. It's an honor to be here um, with you and, and with Amelia Jones sharing this space and this conversation. And these, these topics are, are very personal to me. Um, the essay that I wrote for TDR about which we're talking today is called Yvonne Rainer's Archive. And uh, I have a close working relationship and personal relationship to my subject. I have had the good fortune to work with Yvonne um, since 1999, so over 20 years as a performer. And um, she has become a, a, a family member and a dear mentor to me. So it's rare to have a research subject of that quality. But in reading Amelia Jones's essay, in which Amelia, you write about the affective relations of performance transmission, um, that is perfectly pertinent to, to my essay. Um, my essay came out of research that I did at the Getty Research Institute in Yvonne Rayner's papers. I was there doing this research to inform a reconstruction of her 1965 dance, Parts of Some Sextets, which I had persuaded her uh, the world needed to see. And why did the world need to see this dance? Um, I have taught Yvonne's work at Yale University for the last 15 years. And so know the literature quite well and know her writing quite well. And it seemed to me that, that this dance was a, a pivot point in her early choreographic work um, that um, had caused a turn in, in her aesthetic interests, in her performance research, and also caused her um, to write an essay that she submitted to TDR in 1965. That is, it's a kind of process report about making this mattress dance and her concerns um, and the evolution of her concerns. And in this essay, at the very end, there is a kind of offhand postscript that she throws in, in which she's thinking about what she was trying to do and whether she succeeded or failed in this very specific evening length dance parts of some sextets. And that postscript has since come to be called the, um, it's a series of no's. Part of me doesn't even wanna say the term, but it, it's a series of no's, it's a run on sentence, and it in hindsight has come to be called the no manifesto. And it has always bothered me and bothered those of us who know Yvonne's work very well, 
that the no manifesto has come to stand in not only for all of her choreographic work and interests of the 1960s, but all of, in fact, postmodern dance aesthetics um, in, um, subsequently. And it seemed to me, if we revive the dance that she was thinking through when she penned those words, we might start to dismantle the grip of those, um, that sequence of no's, the declarative, if you will. So I went into her archive and the first thing it's electrifying to be in the archive of some of one that you know very well, um, who's now much older than who she was when writing the materials that are in her papers. I focused between the years of 1960 and 1966. Um, and I can say I, I know her work well, but it challenged my assumptions about her work. I had always assumed that her writing and her choreographic work kind of occupied um, separate yet very related and overlapping poles. And that the choreographic work then informed the essay or the writing, and then that helped carry forward her thinking, which then fed back into her choreographic work. And what I realized in the archive, and of course then could cross check with my subject who was on email while I was there, and I could shoot her any questions that I had. Um, what I realized is that it, it's so deeply integrated in her work, the ways that she um, used language and the ways that she was working in the studio, it, it wasn't cyclical at all so much as, as, as deeply intertwined. And I go through, sorry, I have a motion detector light in my office that <laughs> I don't know how to turn off. Um, I will be jumping up periodically. Um, and once in the essay for TDR, I go through some of the really specific close reading of these scraps that are in her papers that show you this really vivid, active relationship between the movement and the verbal languages. Um, and once you understand something about that complexity, I think it puts these, these no's in, into much greater context. And it makes clear that they're just part of the verbal stream that accompanied, fed, and informed her process. Um, and I can say that also from this archive, two revelations came out in these papers about the so-called no manifesto. The first was there are drafts of the essay for TDR here in the archive. And in these drafts, there is far more speculation than ended up in the final piece. So she crosses out the questions that she had around making this, um, statement or declaration of resisting the temptation of European American aesthetics in concert dance to date. Once she resists, she's also speculating, what then am I leaving the audience with? Maybe there is something here, there is more here um, than I can see or understand or reveal. So that it was very clear that the declarative sentence that is in the published work um, suppressed and erased completely the speculation that's in the archive. And two, what became clear in her journal, her notebook, is that the no manif the no's specifically when they came out in TDR in 1965, made a splash and frankly pissed a lot of people off. So from the outset, you drop a declarative into the water and it became all anyone could talk about, it seemed, and subsequently, historically, the thing that gets remembered. We're here, I think, today to talk about uh, performance history and the way that performance history actually um, strangles and erases performance research. And I think the only way that the reductions in the history writing can be challenged is to really track closely the creative processes of 
the artists in question. And, and that's what this deep dive and focus on Ivan's early papers um, allowed me to do in the essay that I then published uh, in TDR. One more quick thing, I will say, Richard Schechner was the editor of TDR in 1965 when Yvonne submitted the essay and it was um, published. Michael Kirby was the guest editor. And when I submitted this essay to TDR, it was through the general submissions email. I will tell you several months later, I, I nearly fell off my chair when Richard Schechner emailed me back <laughs> to accept the essay. And I can say that Richard, I think you are very much part of this living archive uh, and, and the ways that performance research becomes performance history conversation in the flesh. Well, thank you. I do remember it was my first stint. For those who don't know TDR history, I was not the founding editor, but I was the second editor. And I edited it from 1962 to 1969. And then I stopped for 16 years and I began editing again uh, in uh, 1985, and I'm still editing it. Michael Kirby and I were dear friends, and it was through Michael that I was introduced. And this is a, a link because I met through Michael, both Yvonne Rayner and Alan Caprell. And uh, I uh, uh, participated in some of those early happenings. Uh, Caprell's first happening was in 1959. And I think Yvonne was uh, uh, doing postmodern dance. We, uh, that issue probably brought the term to, uh, you know, to a more general uh, public at about the same time. It was an extraordinarily uh, fruitful time. And it, the proof of the fruit is that we're still, you know, picking apples from those same trees. So now I want to turn to Amelia Jones and Suzanne Lacey, who also uh, Whisper the Waves, I think, was in TDR. And uh, so that we also have a, a, a connection there. Uh, to uh, performance art, or well, I don't know if Amelia wants to call it performance art. It wasn't called performance art at that in those times. It was called happenings. It was called performance, whatever it was called. But uh, Suzanne uh, Lacey uh, very, very importantly uh, was one of the people who uh, made socially significant and yet intensely personal, the personal is political, et cetera, et cetera, Carol Hanisch, this whole world. So I want to turn now to Amelia to talk about her essay, her archive. Uh, please, Amelia, uh, welcome. Um, thank you so much, Richard. I am going to show a PowerPoint because I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> I just have to have the visuals. And I wanted to refer to that beautiful phrase, Emily, you said a few minutes ago about the affective relations of performance transmission. And of course, this is very personal for me as well. Suzanne is actually now a colleague of mine here at the Roski School of Art and Design. And she may even be popping in at some moment. I, I invited her, we have MFA studio visits today. So that would be a very weird but interesting <laughs> example of how controllable and not controllable it is to work on living artists. Um, so I just briefly wanted to mention that this article, which is long and dense, um, began in relation to an exhibition based on CalArts, of all things, in Germany. Why is a show about a Los Angeles art school in Germany? Excellent question. Um, it would be interesting to know more about that. Um, but when I was invited to give a talk there, I immediately thought of this idea I've had for at least maybe 10 or 15 years about Suzanne Lacey as occupying this kind of unique nexus between two extremely different artists, both of whom are known in the history of art and performance, Judy Chicago and Alan Capra. And uh, this just gives you one of many views of the show. And you can see that one of the amazing things they had was from the Getty archives and it was the notebooks by Suzanne from Alan Capra's class. You know, it's like having access to the initial thought processes or at least 
one version, one map of them through the archive is really exciting. It was an amazing show. And it also had, as you can see, artworks and videos, et cetera, by some of the artists at CalArts in the very early days. So that's where this initially came from. Um, and I wanted to, you know, obviously avoid some kind of crude causal argument about Judy Chicago plus Alan Capro equals Suzanne Lacey. That's not how pedagogy works. It's not how bodies work. It's not how thought works. But at the same time, I was super interested in how elements of Capro's and Chicago's pedagogy and performances definitely um, were taken up and reworked by Suzanne. And she is the only major artist who, who was a student of both of those teachers and one of the only people in the world who was a student of both of them. So there's a whole history behind that, which I sketch briefly in the article. Um, the major issues that come to the fore are, um, you know, again, I'm just sketching this extremely briefly, are the obviously rights movements, the feminist, very on the surface politics of someone like Judy Chicago, especially at this moment where she was teaching and running the feminist art program. And then obviously the, um, with both Capro and Chicago, the mobilization of the body in the work, um, which for Judy was only very early on took the form of performance and then became more integrated into her visual arts practice. For Capro, obviously his entire career after he left abstract painting really was uh, performance related. So they, they represent part of an epic shift to process and to art as socially embedded and relational. And so there are many different aspects of that that I go through in the article. The shift to also, both of them represent the shift to an idea of pedagogy and the exchange of knowledge as collaborative rather than additive. That was an extremely exciting part of what CalArts did in its early days. And both Chicago and Capro have written about that specifically pedagogical element and how it relates to performance. Um, so this shows you, I couldn't resist showing this version of Woman House at the Hanover show, which was so fascinating the way this group of, I think it was a group of design and architecture students who thought of recreating the show spatially as the act actual house existed with these kind of reproductions of elements of woman house. So an immersive embodied experience, even when it's installation um, and everything Chicago uh, was teaching was also very much in synergy with across the U S but also specifically in LA uh, with artists activating um, issues of power and exclusion with their bodies, often on the streets, sometimes in gallery settings. So the activism art nexus in Los Angeles, specifically at this time in the, you know, around 1970 is something I also address. So the Chicano arts movement, the black arts movement, these are all movements that understand the same way Judy Chicago understood that art has to be part of the social scene. It cannot be an isolated kind of private activity. And of course that was also compatible with what Capro was doing. Um, Chicago stressed embodiment, a full body mind commitment through her pedagogy, which involved mod what she called modified consciousness raising. Um, the women would talk about their experiences and work those into performances such as ablutions, art as motivated by emotions and experience and kind of validating women's experience and emotions in that way. Um, Capra, of course, was <clears throat> not coming out of the feminist movement um, and did not foreground political issues. He presented his work and he taught as if art could still be dis 
build from those direct connections to the political. At the same time, his work has political effects. And one of the fascinating things is to look at some of the collaborations between Lacey and Capro and some of the debates that they had where she really pushed him on the fact that the work was political, even though he wasn't foregrounding that in the classroom. I mean, and this, you know, I'm just as a teaser putting up these images from a very highly charged performance that involves a naked man and a woman which whether Capra wanted to admit it or not would have had political valence during this period. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just end up going through um, their pedagogical kind of psychology and tactics and then exploring works, especially early works by Suzanne Lacey to understand elements of how she was carrying forward this idea of art as being in the world through the body of the artist. The prostitution notes is a great example of that where she's wandering the streets of LA and interviewing prostitutes, making a map, making um, imagery in a video. Uh, the more kind of she merged very publicly and the best known work for that moment was the three weeks in May project where she's explicitly dealing with a political issue of rape and violence against women and creating these kind of maps, but also you can see from the image on the left, the point was not just for her to perform in a gallery space, but for the work to be social. And this is what leads to what we now call social practice. So I think in closing, I think my argument would be that this is one of many ways to understand the complexities of where social practice came from. And I'm adamant that it comes out of these specific political and pedagogical and aesthetic contexts. And this, I'm just offering this really as one case study, one way of grounding that through a specific practice, in this case, Suzanne Lacey's. Um, and yeah, so I'll end with that other than noting that these are ongoing relationships other than of course Capro having passed away, but you still have Suzanne Lacey and Judy Chicago in dialogue. And until Capro's death, Lacey was very directly engaging him and they did projects together and so on. So this is not just like a pedagogical moment frozen in 1970. It's a kind of collaborative process that moves forward in time and informs contemporary social practice very deeply. So the, I'll end with that. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, throw in one more irony that you, uh, well, it's not irony, but a coincidence you probably know, but the founder of CalArts is Robert Corrigan. And uh, or the first dean, and Robert Cargan was the director of my research, and the founding editor of TDR, and also the founder of the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. So uh, he passed away a long time ago, but he was a kind of Johnny Appleseed starting these things: TDR, the NYU School, the Cal Arts, and also a, a, an art school in, in in Dallas. All right, so uh, <laughs> I did. I don't know Judy Chicago, but the other players I do know just to, to some degree. Capro was the one I knew the best. Um, so I'd like to ask the both of you, uh, how do you feel your work inter interacts? I'm assuming that you've not been on panels together uh, before this. This is a kind of distance panel, but uh, how do you feel uh, they, they interact? Because I also, when you were talking about uh, uh, Capro and Lacey, Lacey being overtly political, and Caprow saying, well, my work is not political, though obviously it had political ramifications. And Yvonne Rayner, I think also probably, I, I don't know, Emily, I'll ask you, would not think of herself as a political activist as such, but she knows the consequences of the work she's done. In other words, if politics can be partly defined as the change of a social system and, so, and the social awareness, then these are deeply uh, political uh, artists uh, they're not out there working for the Bourbons, just, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're engaged in social change. How do you feel, each of you, and I, and I don't know who would like to go first, your, your work 
impacts each other, the work of the artists you're working with, but also your own work in the archive, because I want this panel not only to be about the people you're about, but to be about you and how you do your, how you conduct your research uh, into uh, living, living artists who are also friends. So the obvious uh, problem, if it is a problem, of maintaining objectivity and critical analysis with people uh, for whom you have a, 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 a deep positive feeling. So that, you know, uh, so all of those questions. So one, how does your work impact each other? How is it to work with people? Uh, and how do you maintain a certain, or do you maintain a certain critical analytical distance with people that you are uh, obviously uh, uh, close to uh, physically and uh, uh, um, emotionally and artistically? So I don't know who would like to address some of that package first. Uh, maybe Amelia, you go first because Emily went first last time and then, and then Emily. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, I found Emily's essay so moving because there's, you're able to articulate as someone who has actually danced from Yvonne Rayner's notations and from conversations with her you know, and I was thinking, well, I can't do that. You know, I can't, I'm not going to go out and do a social practice work, even if I talk to Suzanne. Um, so I thought that level of, of your article, the way that you tied together, you know, archival research, which is thought to be this like scholarly thing with this very embodied relationship was the most powerful thing about it. And it made me feel the limits of my own scholarship. That said, I've always not just activated, but kind of self-consciously foregrounded my biases and my relationships when they do come to bear on some of my scholarships. So no, I do not believe there's such a thing as objectivity, but you know, it would be silly to say that I, you know, I just willfully let myself get absorbed into some hagiographic relationship, which I've worked extensively with Judy Chicago. I did the first big show that included the dinner party in 1996 after its initial run. And, you know, Judy is a very powerful person and I, I had to work hard not to get um, absorbed, partly because I kind of wanted to get absorbed into Through the Flower and all of her various kind of um, art structures. And so it's one thing to say there's no objectivity, but it's another thing to admit that, yes, but, you know, and, and I'd be interested to hear you say more, Emily, about you can't just get absorbed into the person, first of all, because it's impossible. Second of all, because it's really not useful or interesting to write work on a living artist that is slavishly positive. It doesn't help the artist, it's not interesting. And so I've always tried to work with those frictions and kind of keep some of the frictions in place. And I can say more about that, but let me just give it to you at this moment, Emily. Emily? Thank you, yeah, um, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, I, and, and Amelia, those are such, great questions and I, this is exactly what I love to talk about. And so I'm excited to be talking about it with you and with Richard. I first wanna say Richard to your point about Yvonne being a political activist. I think she very much would consider herself a political activist and herself a political artist. I think it's complicated. That's what we're talking about here, right? Is that uh, she's listening to this webinar right now and I hope I'm representing her well, but having heard her speak quite a bit about it publicly, her early work uh, was focused on movement and then this language integrated in the essays and the choreographic notes and the transcriptions and found texts. But I believe she moved out of dance because she felt like she needed language to express social political concerns. So, um, then she has 25 years of filmmaking in which she, I think, felt more fully able to express that uh, side of her art. 
and then came back into dance in the 21st century. And I see the 21st century dances in part as trying to then reconcile the political uh, activism and expressivity of her films with her early dance interests. All of that I, I can know partly and largely because I have performed in her work since 1999. And this circles back, Amelia, to your point about um, how do you use movement research and, and how do you use performance research? And I will say, this is why I became um, captivated by the promise of performance studies that I could do, I think, Richard, what you have done, be an artist, think about that practice, use that practice as research, but also think in, in broader contexts uh, and attach that knowledge and that information to um, broader theses and arguments. And in the essay, Yvonne Rainer's archive, that's also me trying to think about how to do that in a way that doesn't, I think like you say, Amelia, descend into solipsism, a process journal, um, or um, biases. I think my essay is biased. I will say that, <laughs> like, yes, it is, it is um, inflected by my relationship to Yvonne Rayner. And, and I thank you, Amelia, for giving me the term affective relations, because um, that's theorizing what it is that I am doing. And that's why we need you. <laughs> we need people like you who may not be um, on the, uh, in the art, so to speak, but we need you to, to frame, um, to frame, to give us words to thoughtfully frame what's happening. We also need you to say, and I'm gonna quote from your essay, uh, artistic movement categorizations and formalist histories of contemporary art have been damaging to the understanding of the complexities of artistic production. So we need a theorist like you to puncture the theory, to help those who are using practice as research, who are also trying to chip away at it. Um, you saying it bears a, a, a convincing weight. Um, mm. I, 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 I could have said that in my essay, actually. We meet at that point, do you know, yes. that these categorizations of history um, are damaging to the understanding of the complexities of artistic production. That is a shared point. We simply arrive at it through two yeah. different methods and modes of writing. Yeah. I'd love to just say one more thing about that because yeah. I didn't, didn't want to take too much time when I was presenting, but I do have a whole first part of the essay where I bring in Lucy Lepard. So she's, I just want to give her a lot of credit for being one of the major thinkers of that period who actually did start as an artist and wrote from as a central part of communities of artists. And her book, her essay in 1968 and then her book on dematerialization was kind of the inspiration for moving away, for using that as a kind of core argument, Emily. So that's something that's bothered me for 25, 30 years coming originally out of art history is the, you know, the conceptual artists are doing this and then the performance artists are doing it. Like if you take more than a glance at the 60s, all of the interesting artists were doing all of those things. Correct. So that's where I come up with this term, the conceptual body and where I'm able to mobilize Lucy Lepard's work and it's so complementary to what both Capro and Chicago, and then in turn, Lacey is kind of building on. So I, I do think it's fascinating that we're both in a way talking about something that is, is generated, especially in New York in the 60s. And then I'm kind of moving it. It gets elements of it get transported to Southern California, right. but there's a pre-existing set of political movements and demographics here. And so that's why I was insistent on presenting OSCO and the Black Arts Movement, because that's, that's a whole other set of arguments is how limited that story remains. If you stay within the official institutions, it's a very white story. 
and the the Cal Arts show, literally, in order to have one person of color, they had to like change the date of the ending of the framework of the show to the early 80s so they could jam in Carrie Mae Williams. I mean, literally entirely white. So that's a whole other conversation is like how if we stick to the embodied relation as a white person with the other white feminists, we're not going to tell a story that's very different. So let me, I know that uh, Christian wants to go to the question, but let me throw a little bit of a bombshell in here and ask you both. So the 60s and this period in the 70s were periods of great conflict, but also great hope. Uh, we're now living in a period of great conflict and the people I talk to are kind of hopeless or many are hopeless. It's just not the same feeling uh, of we're gonna overcome this kind of stuff. Uh, it's more like uh, you know the twilight of democracy and so on. And both uh, these uh, artists in, in their own way are dealing with democracy, a kind of postmodern dance uh, has been described as the, you know, the pedestrian movement, the democratization of dance, the moving down and of certainly Suzanne and Judy Chicago, the dinner party, I still remember that as a powerful uh, piece and the, uh, the quilts and so on. So what do you feel about uh, your work and their work in terms of our particular time now? Uh, not, not so much the COVID, I mean, you can do that, but I'm talking about our political moment where the, uh, uh, not simply the United States, but Western, so-called Western civilization is fractured. You know, we have uh, Orban in Hungary, we have uh, Putin, we have the, the right wing in, in France, we have alternative for Germany and Germans in Germany. So it's not just what's happening in, 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 in the United States. There's a kind of crisis. And, and the, these artists that you're talking about in the 60s and 70s were at a, dealing with a crisis, but at a kind of crest way forward. What do you think about their work and their ideas in terms of our current uh, political crisis. Uh, I, I realize this is a whole other thing, yeah. and, and then and then we'll open it to the uh, to the discussion. And if you feel I've overstepped my bounds here, uh, just say, "Well, we'll deal with that uh, next time." Well, I think that's an amazing conversation. It's a very long and complicated one. Yes, um, I would say that we definitely need new tools. I would also say that. Um, I think a lot of white people feel like it's so, so much worse now and a sense of hopelessness. I'm not sure that's the case in the same way with my colleagues and friends who are BIPOC because after all, in some ways they have a lot more, um, for example, in the arts, they you know, have a lot more space being made yes. for what they have to say. So uh, the sixties in the arts, you know, we're really not moving forward very much in that way. So I well, would say- I, I was working in the free Southern theater at that point. So that's a counter example because I was doing yeah. a theater, black theater in the South, in the deep South, but that's- Yeah, you know, but I mean- the, the same play as these, other stuff. But these mainstream, like Yvonne Rayner in right. New York in the sixties, you know, that was a particular thing. And in as, as much hope as maybe, white liberalism had with this civil rights um, bill and so on, it's complicated. And I, I just want to complicate that because I think the sense of hopelessness I'm perceiving as mostly a sense of horror and confusion among white liberals who we all thought things were just going to get inexorably better and there was going to be this progress because we all bought into the enlightenment, you know, and right. maybe the enlightenment is ending and maybe something, I mean, so I'm hoping something can replace it. That, that is, you know. a, we'll have a second, maybe TDR webinar about it. So I agree. I once wrote a book called the end of humanism, which really foreshadowed the end. I, 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 I think the enlightenment has ended. Emily, can you say, want to say yeah, a, I, a few I, things I and jump then, in. then back to Christian? Yes. Um, I, in, in Amelia's essay, I really appreciated your emphasis that uh, in institutions of higher education, in the arts, there was an acute attention to class, race, and gender, 
in the 1960s and the 70s. And um, having taught now at Yale for 15 years, it felt uh, my observation is that that lull in when I began teaching um, and then has risen again in the last five years into a, a you know, in the young generation that's passing through right now, among my students, acute attention to race, gender, and uh, class. And, and so how, how to teach these aesthetics that came out of the 60s in Judson Dance Theater, uh, which I am doing this semester, a course that focuses on Judson Dance Theater, postmodern dance and all its fraught um, definition and its evolution today. And it's an interesting arc where, of course, those artists were all white, uh, Yvonne and, and company, Italian-American, Jewish-American. Um, and out of that, the more recent work that artists of color have picked up the aesthetic tools and, and radically argued with them, altered them and transformed them, you know, I can, name just one artist whom I think we all love, um, who has done that so persuasively, Ralph Lemon, who has spoken very eloquently, you know, I heard him give a keynote at UC Santa Barbara, in which he paid homage to the white women who shaped him, even as he also critically dismantled the work and showed new pathways for it. And so when I teach this, these aesthetics, I, um, I can point out that it was liberatory insofar as they could see in their circle. It was anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-patriarchal. Um, and what the collection that was Judson Dance Theater um, could, could not and was not engaging with was a larger anti-racism conversation. But if you look at the aesthetic evolution and the artists who are working with some of those ideas today, it has become um, taken up in, in anti-racism efforts. So you can trace that arc and, and think about it, argue with it. Um, Amelia, you say we need new tools. I think that's very true to deal with what's happening today. And I also think that for the young generation passing through who are my students, it is helpful to know what the tools were, what the shortcomings of those tools were, to argue with them, replace them, reinvent them. And, and it's in that spirit that I teach the work. I, I want them to oppose it <laughs> as much as I want them to understand what it did in the moment. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Christian, uh, you're on. I, I assume that there are some uh, questions. For, uh, uh, there uh, are, so actually it's going to be me. So. Oh. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm Holly O'Neill. Um, I'm the commissioning editor uh, for performance studies journals at Cambridge, and I work with CDR. And um, because Christian's audio was a little crackly earlier, uh, we decided that I'd look after the, the Q&A. Um, so thank you very much, firstly, for what was a really fascinating discussion. It was really, really interesting to listen to, especially towards the end there. So I don't want to kind of cut across your conversation because that was, yeah, that was really very interesting and um, we do have just two direct questions um, at the moment for the panelists and then we can just move into a little bit of closing and um, so the first question that we have is from Wendy Perron or Perron P-E-R-R-O-N. Yeah, so we know her, yes. Ap apologies for my pronunciation Wendy um, and the question is um is for Emily and says, did you ever find out who was the first person who isolated the no postscript and called it the no manifesto? That is a great question, Wendy. And I, I evade that research because I never did find it out um, except to say Sally Baines from the moment Tripsicker and Sneakers was published, the no manifesto as you will know quite well, uh, Wendy is very present in her way of understanding and thinking about Yvonne's work. Um, I, I couldn't trace back earlier than that, but the revelation was Yvonne noting in one of her notebooks, when the issue was published, she alludes to the publication and has, has three points. And one um, 
and I'm forgetting the exact order, but two of them stand out. One, she says, the word is more powerful than the leg. So this was her reckoning with the power of language and the printed text over performance uh, and embodied um, knowledge and movement. And then two, she says the, the, something to the effect of the world reacts as though I've thrown all of Western civilization into the Indian Ocean, me and Leroy Jones. <laughs> so it was clear based on that notebook that it had already made a splash in 1965 when it was published. And Sally Baines, being a good historian, wasn't necessarily a lazy historian, was picking up the shockwaves of that declarative and then using it as a tool to theorize Yvonne's work. Thank you. Thank Holly. you very much. And then we have a question for Amelia, which comes from Celia Vara. And she says, you talk about empathy in art research in the introduction to the book, Kinesthetic Empathy in Creative and Cultural Practices by Reynolds and Reason. Can you develop more how empathy can be used as an embodied aspect of research? Yes, hi Celia, wonderful to have you here. Um, I mean, I guess in answering that now, I would make it broader and say that you can approach research with disgust, you can approach it with empathy. I mean, sometimes you research something because it's an artwork or a performance in my field that you find extremely problematic. So in fact, it's not always empathy that connects to you, but the empathy issue is extremely important with any um, practice where you want, well, let's put it this way, a historical performance practice where you're trying to imagine what it would be like or what it would have been like to be in proximity to those bodies doing that thing. And I think that's where, without sitting with yourself as you're looking over whatever documentation or access you have to what you imagine that performance to have been, without kind of watching your feelings and thinking about it, you don't really have access to performance. And that's very specific to performance, I think. Um, if you're witnessing a live performance, again, you know, I talk to my students a lot about this because some performance is very difficult and upsetting. I just curated a show of the work of Ron Athey and it's a perpetual issue that comes up. Many people find, you know, extreme BDSM, body cutting and sexual actions really disturbing. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and what I say is, can you sit with the feelings that you have and explore where they're coming from? And chances are you will find a strand of empathy that will allow you some kind of understanding for where that artist is coming from. So with Ron, for me, I had a turning point where I didn't really appreciate, I respected his work, but I didn't really appreciate it. And I certainly wasn't gonna spend years and years uh, curating a show about it until my life fell apart at one point when I was living in Manchester and I went to see Judas Cradle and he impales himself on this giant Judas Cradle. And so this is like a, an extremely charged moment for me where I just completely connected to it. So I didn't have to work on kind of, you know, finding a strand of empathy, but actually it just made sense to me because I was in pain. I was in emotional pain and the activation of the potential range of emotions through a physical action just suddenly clicked. And so those are different examples for me of how empathy in particular, when you're either researching past performance or experiencing live performance, it's an important, I think, element to access in order to connect to what the artist was doing or is doing. Whether or not that's accurate in terms of what the artist imagines they're doing. 
Excellent, because we, we often think, you know, maybe somebody at my age, we think of T.S. Eliot and objective correlatives rather than empathy. But I think the tension between an objective correlative, a certain kind of critical distance and empathy is very, very important. And I, I think in my own experience, when I first saw in reality, Guernica of Picasso, and all of a sudden I was in the middle of the Spanish Civil War. Of course, I, I'm not that old. I didn't remember it directly, but I knew a lot about it. And it, and it was formative in my uh, early political years. And to see that picture, all of a sudden, I was not seeing what I had thought I was going to see, which is like a cubist deconstruction of reality, but I was seeing bodies being torn apart. I mean, I can still see it inside here. And I was inside the, the process that led to the painting rather than just the painting itself. So that's how I, uh, to some degree, experience empathy, getting inside the process that leads to the work I'm experiencing. And you can't maintain a distance at that. You have to pull back if you want to do distance after that. But the tension is very powerful. Emily, do you have anything you would like to say to this uh, question? And, and, and your ident deep identification because you danced the work of the person you're studying. I, I think only, I mean, you've both spoken so well. Um, I remain interested in um, e emotion in the body in embodied knowledge and, and performance practical research and figuring out how to keep it in the um, definition of knowledge as it transacts in, in academic discourse and writing. So fully, fully agree with what you both have said. Thank you. Holly, are there any other questions out there? No, so that's all of our questions that have come in for to, to be directly answered, though we do sometimes get some after the fact and we'll send those around afterwards. Um, and then we'll send around answers to, um, to all the participants as well. Okay, so well, we're coming to a close of this phase of things. I don't know if either of our distinguished uh, uh, speakers, guests, friends, scholars, practitioners want to uh, say a few things uh, uh, as a, a kind of final word. Uh, uh, I, I, I won't speak again, so I'd like to say that for me, I, I've learned and enjoyed this. This is a really, uh, 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 has been a splendid webinar uh, for me and I hope for you as well. So Amelia or Emily, is there anything uh, you would like to add to what has been uh, said thus far and what you've uh, stated? Well, I'm gonna say something really corny and, but I think necessary that vis-a-vis um, -vis hopelessness, you know, neoliberal late capital wants you to be hopeless. Okay, so that's true. Let's not accede to that. Let's not accede to this idea just because enlightenment concepts have been challenged. It does not mean we can't go forward. And Richard, your extremely long and illustrious career is an example of just the moving forward is, is the thing. You keep moving forward. Yvonne Rayner keeps moving forward, keeps finding different ways to say or do what she needs to express. Right. But I guess what I'm, uh, uh, to go beyond myself, uh, I, I speak to a lot of younger people and, uh, uh, and, and people of color as well as so-called whites. I say so-called because that whole racial category thing is fraught, let's put it that way. At any rate, some of them, uh, more than I would expect, are, are uh, uh, frozen in place to some degree. Uh, uh, and I would, uh, uh, that's, I guess that's what troubles me, not my own uh, feelings so much as some of the things I encounter in the letters uh, I get in the people I meet uh, and in uh, certain kinds of uh, like falling birth rates, whatever. Uh, there are certain uh, metrics that indicate uh, a, 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 a move towards a, a darker time. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff not so much about uh, COVID, but about climate change and what what it might what it might portend for us about the uh, uh, extreme tension between the the South and the North, represented by the people trying to cross the Mediterranean. I see that those boats 
as a kind of harbingers of, 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 of desperation and at the American, uh, at the Rio Grande, at the border. These things for me are both actual and metaphorical. They're extraordinarily, extraordinarily performative because of what they point to as well as what they are, uh, you know, both. So I guess that's what, uh, and, uh, but I hear you, Amelia, I, I hear what you're saying. And I do think that we, you know, we could have a whole other discussion and, and, and actually, you know, about uh, what, what comes after the enlightenment and, and, and where it originates from. It, does it originate from Belt and Road or rather, you know, uh, it not, it's not necessarily going to be a Western invention uh, the, the new, uh, thought pattern and the uh, belt and road, the Chinese, uh, uh, system of foreign involvement, uh, is a really interesting concept. The Marshall plan was, was a Western thing belt and road suggests some kind of encompassing grasp. It's not exactly colonialism, but it's not, not colonialism either. Uh, Emily, you have anything to say to that, or Amelia? Well, I don't. I was thinking, how can I sum this up? But I will say, um, just to sum up what you're both saying, and I think what we're making the points in our essays: be suspicious of categorizations, be suspicious of generalizations. It is a political act, and I think an ethical responsibility to close read the details. And and finally, um, to quote Elizabeth Alexander the amazing poet know the whole damn history very good yeah very good amelia oh no emily's words will go last beautiful yeah i agree so firstly i wanted to thank all of our panelists today that was a really fascinating discussion and richard i really like your idea of having yet another tdr webinar because i want to hear how the rest of this discussion goes <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, I would just like to thank all of you for such a, such a fascinating talk. Um, and just to say um, thank you very much to our audience members as well um, for their time and their attention. Um, do check out past TDR webinars, uh, which you can find at www.cambridge.org slash TDR. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us today. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Emily, thank uh, you. Amelia. Thank, thank you so thank much. You Bye. Bye.